What's up guys, Duncan the Highlander here. This is my first time doing a little sauna talk. I got my buddy Teddy, and he's like my, my like young Jamie. He's been motivating me and being like, you gotta make more videos. And I was just starting to talk to him about the fights today, and I was like, I might as well record this. So the very first fight of the night is Randy Costa versus Brandon Davis. What's pretty exciting about this fight is Randy Costa comes from Joe Lozon's gym. He is a New England guy. He's a local fighter and he is making his first UFC debut. He's like the perfect example of why I tell people why I've waited so long to go pro. He's had four professional fights. And on his fifth fight, he is now going into the UFC. Now, he is fighting at a weight division, 135, where it's a little more practical or a little more possible for you to get a fast entry into the UFC, whereas I'm fighting at 170, 155, where there's a lot more people. But he's just a perfect example of why I've waited so long, kept being amateur, waited to go pro, because once you make that jump, you can get a call and be in the UFC next second. And then he's fighting Brandon Davis. What's pretty cool about Brandon Davis is he also is connected to another UFC New England local fighter, whereas he fought Kyle Botniak. Kyle Botniak is most famous for losing against Zabit Magomed Sharapov. Zabit Magomed Sharapov. So Kyle Botniak fought Zabit. He's most famous for that guy. He's the guy who was bit down on his mouthpiece and was just coming forward. But it's just kind of cool, interesting, seeing New England fighters. And Brandon Davis happens to have another chance to fight a second New England fighter. People who train together. Kyle Botniak, Randy Costa, they all train at Joe Lozon's. Kyle doesn't fight out of there, but it's all local people. Um, Kyle and Cater, all those guys. So I'm just very excited about that first fight. That's starting off the Bantam. I mean, starting off the uh, early prelims. Then we got a women's flyweight fight. I'm going to be honest. No idea who either of these people are, so we're going to skip it. The fight after that is another Bantamweight fight. Montel Jackson. He is famous, or fairly famous, I guess, for having a really, really long reach. He has... Maybe the longest reach and some of the biggest hands at bantamweight. I think they said that his hands were bigger than um, Francis Ngannou's hands, or his hands were as big as like a heavyweight's hands. Okay. So this guy's 135, and his hands are massive. He has heavyweight size hands, and he is fighting Andre Sukmatok, who is another New England Boston fighter. So it's kind of cool. New England's getting a little shine here, and um, he is fairly famous for another loss. He's famous for losing to Sean O'Malley, where Sean O'Malley was like bouncing around on one foot and was still fighting him. So just another cool, interesting, you know, New England fighters getting their chance. And then we're ending it off with Curtis Millinder fighting Bilal Muhammad. And if I'm going to add in another New England wrinkle, because I'm from New England, so obviously I'm going to keep finding little ways to add it in there. Bilal Muhammad is coached by Mike Brown. Mike Brown is a main fighter came out of Maine, probably the most credentialed fighter to ever come out of the state, and he's now one of the best coaches in the world, so it's pretty cool, interesting little thing, he's one of the coaches at ATT, so he is um, Bala Muhammad's coach, and he'll be fighting Cur Curtis Millinder, Curtis Millinder is like a nice, slick, out type fighter, he uses a lot of kicking, a lot of different stuff at range, whereas Bala Muhammad is very good at every aspect of the game, and he's some someone, I wouldn't call it journeyman, but I would say maybe he's like a, a skilled journeyman. He's someone that you have to be very skilled to beat, but people can beat him, but only the best of the best beat him. And if you beat him, that means you're very legit. You're in the higher S on. So now the um, prelim card, starting off, Boston Salmon versus Khalid Tala. Now I'm not going to lie, I'm going to, there are some people that I don't know. So Boston Salmon, he's another, I want to, Ironically, I think he's from Boston. If not, maybe I'm just making that up. I've seen a few of his fights, but I don't know much about him, and I don't know much about the next couple fights. I don't know much about Max Griffin. All I know is that he won a uh, good fight against uh, Mike Perry. Mike Perry is fairly famous right now, Platinum Mike Perry, for being a strong guy. Max Griffin beat him. I know nothing about his opponent. And then at flyweight, we have Wilson Hayes. He is... A uh, very highly ranked Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner. I also don't know anything about his opponent. And then bringing it up to the main event. I don't know the first guy, but I have a little personal connection to the second guy. So the main event of the prelim, we have Jalen Turner, who I've been hearing some talks about being a very 
um, highly touted prospect, but I don't know much about him. And he is fighting Matt Frivola. Matt Frivola is someone, I mean, we follow each other on Instagram, we DM each other, so I kind of feel like I have a little relationship with him. One of the guys that I train with, Alan Barubi, is good friends with Matt Frivola. Matt um, fought on the Dana White Contender Series and made it into the UFC through that route. So it's pretty interesting, cool little dude. He trains at um, Henzo Gracie's in New York, and he trains with uh, what's his name? He trains with Chris Weidman and all those folks over there. So it's pretty interesting. Very excited to see where he goes. And especially when you get the chance to DM with someone, you feel like you have uh, extra like connection with people like that. So I'm very excited for Matt Favola's fight. I'm hoping that he's going to win. So this brings us all the way to the main event. We got OSP versus Nikita Krylov. Now, this is a pretty exciting fight because... OSP, everyone calls this choke the Von Flu choke, but OSP has been hitting more people with it than Von Flu, so now people are thinking maybe we should call it the OSP choke. That's when you have somebody and they try to hold the uh, guillotine on you for too long and you've already passed them. So when you're in guard, you can whip the guillotine. If you have somebody in your guard or in half guard, you can pull the guillotine on them. But once they pass you, you can't have your head wrapped over them. You're putting yourself in danger to being choked. Von Flu or OSP. OSP has like three or four of those chokes. So this is a pretty interesting fight. And then we have Alan Joban versus Dwight Grant. Alan Joban, he's literally a model. So kind of interesting. One of the few dudes who outside of this is also a model. Very smart, intelligent dude. And he uses a lot of elbows. So just like seeing him fight because he's a very crafty veteran. He uses a lot of different things. He also has a win over Mike Perry from just being an outfighter, hitting range. And then at light heavyweight, we got Eric Anders versus Khalil Roundtree. This is a pretty interesting fight because Eric Anders... I know the rest of the card from there. Um, this is a pretty interesting fight because Eric Anders is... He goes, or he graduated from the same college that my girlfriend's sister goes to right now. So he graduated from Hosva in New York. He has... I don't know anything about football, but I guess he has like all these records for some football position for the college. I wish I could tell you more about that. I don't know anything about football. But he was a very, very, very athletic specimen. He didn't get drafted into the NFL, so he went on to pursue a career at fighting. He's become really good at pressuring, just being gritty, putting his head down, pressuring in on people. And he's fighting Khalil Roundtree. Khalil Roundtree is most famous for two things. He's most famous for gym stories because he was, for years, Anderson Silva's sparring partner and one of his training mates and Anderson Silva for years would talk about this guy Khalil Roundtree who was super legit way better than him he would say and would tell all these stories well we weren't able to see much of that yet besides in his second to last outing where he fought um, Gokan Saki. Gokan Saki is a very highly skilled credentialed kickboxing world champion probably one of the most if not the most highly skilled kickboxer to ever switch over into MMA Outside of Anderson Silva, you know, not Anderson Silva, outside of Israel Adesanya, because he's very um, just credentialed. Israel Adesanya, Alistair Overeem, those guys, Mark Hunt, very credentialed. Um, uh, what's the Croatian guy? Uh, Mirko Krokop. All those guys were very credentialed kickboxers, although Mirko Krokop wasn't even in kickboxing terms that good of a kickboxer. But his kickboxing in MMA, he makes him super, super, super legit. Mark Hunt was a pretty good kickboxer, but in the terms of kickboxing, wasn't even the best kickboxer. Alistair Overeem, on the other hand, was very, very, very legit. And so wasn't, um, Jesus, who was the first guy I said? I forgot. I get, I get in a big, big, big loop. Where were we, where were we just at? Uh, Eric. Ah, Khalil Roundtree. Yeah. So, Khalil Roundtree fought Kokonsaki. Kokonsaki, like I was saying, very highly ranked and credential kickboxer. And Khalil Roundtree was able to knock him out in the first round. And that was, that's probably his biggest victory on his little list but then his fight right after that he fought johnny walker johnny walker is this guy right now who's making a lot of waves coming in here looking like a stripper stripping before he comes into all of his fights and then KOing people in like two or three seconds with like a quick head kick or some flashy spin and that's what happened to Khalil Roundtree. So Khalil Roundtree became victim to a Johnny Walker knockout. So this is his first comeback after that. So we're going to get to see where he's going to be. So this is a nice fight because Khalil Roundtree should be the more technical striker. Whereas Eric Anders is going to want to pressure and come in on the inside. So then we get to the co-main event. This fight gets me fucking 
zit jitters. This gets me all jammed up. We got my boy Henry out here digging. So this fight gets me fucking amped. Okay, so we got Max Holloway versus Dustin Poirier too. Most people forget. Skip, you, oh, you got you got Adesanya and Gaston. Oh shit! I forgot about the. That's not the co-main. The co-main is all right. I forgot. See, okay, okay. the co-main is um Kat, is Adesanya versus Calvin Gaston. I almost forgot all about that. So what's cool about um, Adesanya? This is one of the few YouTube videos that actually blew up because I knew about Adesanya before everybody else. So I posted a video on my YouTube. Check it. The day before he made his debut, being like, "Yo, guys." Check this dude out. He's gonna be very legit. So he's super legit. His kickboxing career was awesome. He was fighting people at heavyweight way above him. He would fight because in kickboxing, you can get away with that. In kickboxing and boxing, you can fight in yes and no. It's what I'm kind of say is what I'm gonna say is like pros and cons, or um, almost like a catch 22. Because in jujitsu, they have what's called absolute divisions so they have the smallest person competing against the biggest person you don't see that in boxing or in combat sports unless you're in japan but at the same time israel adesanya was able to because of his skill he was able to neutralize the fact that these people were bigger than him and it wasn't an issue so he was fighting at heavyweight and winning heavyweight tournaments and fighting at light heavyweight winning light heavyweight tournaments and fighting at middleweight and winning middleweight tournaments so he was very, very, very legit. He's one of the, even in kickboxing, he's one of the few people that uses feints a lot, very intelligently. The shoulder feint, the hip feint, and that's one of the things that I've been trying to work with a lot, is just feinting more. Especially since I've been working with my kickboxing, me and my Taekwondo instructor, he's a lot on feints, and now I just notice how much is he feints compared to everybody else. He doesn't really do that many things. He feints, he jabs, he likes to cut off on angles, where like a, like if he's standing in orthodox he'll cut back to the left so that he comes back in southpaw he likes to cut away from strikes like that and then if he's standing in orthodox cutting back to the left maybe he'll throw his right hand as a check hook so now his right hand which was his rear hand would now be a front um check hook he likes to do like things like that he doesn't do that many different things it's not that he's doing a lot of crazy kicks and stuff like that but it's that he hides it all behind feints so people don't know what's coming because he's using a shoulder feint shoulder feint shoulder feint and then if they don't do anything shoulder feint shoulder feint he drops them if they shoulder feint shoulder feint and they freeze up then he kicks them or does something crazy and then if they think he's going to kick him or do something crazy then he jabs them in the face again a lot of little things and then if they get pissed off and they just charge at him that's where those v-steps come in and he comes off at a side using his ankles so he doesn't do that many things but because it's all hidden behind the feints it looks like a lot and it's hard to like take in and then he's fighting calvin gastelum who I mean, me included. I watched that whole season of The Ultimate Fighter, and I'm like the same age as him. So part of me was salty. It was like, ah, this guy, this guy's doing stuff when I'm like not doing stuff. And another part of me was like, ah, I really want to see Uriah Hall because Uriah Hall had this crazy head kick, all this stuff. Everyone was talking about him fighting Anderson Silva when Anderson Silva was the champion, and this guy's still in the, the UFC. See Ultimate Fighter House. But um, Kyle Gaslam's really interesting. He's gotten so much better as a striker. He is really good southpaw. He uses a lot of deep, um, basic southpaw fundamentals. The one-two, he leads a lot with the lead uppercut, kind of like a gazelle punch. Very... Um, Conor McGregor does that a lot in MMA, and um, Prince Nassim did that a lot in boxing, a lot where if you're in open stance, you can gazelle hop with the lead hand to cover distance, and then rear cross, coming back, a lot of stuff like that. He likes to do a lot of basics like that. He'll double up with the jab, double jab, left hand. He'll do one, two, one, two, a lot of basics. He just fires a lot off the straight. He doesn't have a lot of difference. I mean... I guess it's like something I talk about a lot because there's somebody at my gym who's similar to that. Where, as I say, it's not about basics. It's about fundamentals because that's a different way to put it. Because Calvin Gaston isn't basic. But what it is is highly skilled fundamentals. He doesn't do a lot of different things. But he, you know what he's going to do. But he sneaks, sneaks them in a lot of different ways. And this is just his striking. On top of that, he's actually a grappler. So he's a much better grappler. So we're going to see if he's going to be able to use... His one-two, use the fact that he's fighting from southpaw, which gives you a little better distance, gives you a little range, and see if that's going to be able to get him in on Adesanya. So now, bringing it to the main event. This is the fight I'm most psyched up about. This is Dustin Poirier versus Max Holloway 2. Uh, most people don't even realize that they already fought once, and it ended with Dustin Poirier on top with a mounted triangle armbar. Coach CJ! Peace! Coach CJ.
Was, so it ended, was, it ended <laughs> with Dustin Poirier on top with a mounted triangle armbar. Now, what ended up happening was, and a lot of people talk about it, was that Max Holloway at this time was was leading a lot with flying knees. And as he was leading with flying knees, that's what allowed Dustin Poirier to clinch with him. Before that time, he was doing really good, popping him at range, using his distance. The only two people, actually three people, have beaten Max Holloway in his UFC career. He's lost to Conor McGregor, he's lost to Diego Brandau, and he's lost to, was it Diego Brando? Actually, it might have been, um, Jesus, that guy that looks like Diego Brando. Man, now I can't remember his name. He fought Diego Brando at the end of the UFC um, Ultimate Fighter. I'll come up with it later. But, um, man, I can't think of it right now. But, um, and he's lost to Dustin Poirier. This fight's super interesting because both these guys are volume strikers, but they're volume strikers in two completely different ways. Dustin Poirier is a volume striker compared to most people, but he's a volume striker in that way that he's like a power boxer. So he's like a gritty, in boxing, here's the thing like an MMA that MMA hasn't gotten to yet. MMA has so many different things that people still think of it as, oh, are you a grappler or are you a striker or are you this or that? But people in boxing, people don't think of it like that because it's just boxing. So in boxing, the turns get a lot more depth. You hear if they're a brawler or if they're a boxer. Dennis or Bermudez. Dennis Bermudez, thank you. Dennis Bermudez, thank you. See, that's why I got my young Jamie. Dennis Bermudez, that's the only other person to beat um, Max Holloway. So, and all these, one, the reason why I mention those is because at those times, and it's, I hope that's when I look at my career, I try to, that's the, the things I like to think about, is I try to be like, all right, I've lost those fights for reasons. If you look at Max Holloway, he lost those fights for reasons because he wasn't developed at those points. The fact is, is where he is now is nowhere near where he was then. That's what makes this fight so interesting. This is one of the few fights in recent memory that the UFC isn't using all this stupid bullshit to hype it up. They're actually just talking about the techniques. They're talking about how great of a fighter both these guys are and the fact that this fight is just like the internet, not the internet, the whole universe is going to explode because I can't even like wrap my head around how this fight's going to go. But so like I said, Dustin Poirier, he's someone who... It's like a brawler, but he's not just a brawler, he's a technical brawler. He uses his boxing and his technique to get in on people so that he can land powerful shots. Whereas Max Holloway has no issue coming in and fighting strong, but what he does is he uses volume to pick at people, to piss them off, so that he can get angles on them, and to keep pissing them off, pissing them off, chipping them away, so that eventually he breaks their will and he can just chop them down. It's two similar tactics where they both use a lot of volume, but it's different. Whereas Dustin Poirier is using volume, but it's kind of like, it's like each one of his counts for 10, whereas each one of Max Holloway's maybe counts for one. Dustin Poirier is throwing 100, which is, if Dustin Poirier is throwing 100 and everybody else is throwing 70, Max Holloway is throwing 500. So it's a very interesting fight. I'm very excited for how this is going to go. This is my first time doing this long-ended um, speech about the UFC. I hope you guys give them a chance, like it out. Please sub, subscribe, tell your friends, and I'll make more of these videos. And big shout out and thank you to Teddy for motivating me to keep these things going. Well, peace, and I'm fighting in about two weeks now. That's why I'm chilling in the sauna for so long. Oh, yeah. <laughs>